Hello and welcome to the Dorkomotive Podcast with Brian Loans. On this episode, we're going to talk about the most insane party that was actually a riot ever held at an American race. It was the 1974 United States Grand Prix, and it was an area of Watkins Glen International Raceway known as the Bog. This area ended up full of burned up cars and even a Greyhound bus. It's a story you won't believe, but is 100% true on this episode of the Dorkomotive Podcast with Brian Loans. It's 2 a.m. Saturday morning, and the hardcore boggers are warming up for the weekend's festivities. Two burly bearded men stand in a smoldering fire of upturned garbage cans and old tires, long knives strapped to their thighs, drinking beer. Behind them lies the burnt-out hulk of the weekend's first sacrifice, an old sedan of indefinable lineage. Rising out of the bright night sky, thick, acrid bellows of smoke reach for the high, scuttling clouds. A spectral group of dancers pass by, cavorting to the raucous notes of a kazoo. Men and women are madly intertwined in their grimy jeans, holding out bottles of wine to balance their steps. Like shadows stretch across a brick wall, these forms stumble onward, players possessed by the hearkening strains of death in a medieval dance. These words come from Edmund Horsey on December 6, 1974, in a story from the Harvard Crimson called A Watkins Glen Journal. And that opening passage from the story sets up the topic of what this podcast is going to be about, which is the most out-of-control, destructive, insane weekend in the history of American racing at the 1974 United States Grand Prix held at Watkins Glen International Raceway. And we're going to specifically talk about a small part of that track that no longer exists that was known at the time as the Bog. It was a spectator area that you could pay $15 to go in for basically the entire weekend, let's call it what we would now refer to as native camping. There were no real facilities in that part of the racetrack. There was nothing other than you could pay 15 bucks and park your car and set up your tent and kind of revel in the fun all weekend long. Well, starting in the early 70s, reveling in the fun got a little bit more out of control each year until we get to 1974 and the topic of the discussion, the story we're going to hear today. Have some cool historical research, some some cool kind of quotes from people that were there at the time to give you as we tell the story of what happened at the bog at the U.S. Grand Prix in 1974. It's really interesting to me that the Harvard Crimson reported on this uh, in so many months after the race. So um, just a, a neat kind of example of how big this story got and kind of how out of control the whole party was. So I guess to, to kind of break it down for you to start with, you know, we got to talk about races in, in the modern time or even in the past, you know. Multi-day events always bring out people that want to have a good time, and they, they come these days with campers, and they're stacked full of beer, and they everybody has fun, and maybe it gets a little crazy now and again, but nobody burns Greyhound buses to the ground anymore, and that was one of the things that was burned and destroyed during this incredible event at the 1974 U.S. Grand Prix. The race itself is notable for a couple of reasons outside of this. So when we talk about 1974 and the F1 season, uh, Emerson Fittipaldi is the world champion of 1974, and he earns that world championship at Watkins Glen. And it's important to understand um, and, and the kind of the reason that this thing got so out of hand in, is in part because of Emerson Fittipaldi. Not something that he did, the fact that he was there, and the fact that Formula One is a global sport and always has been, is the reason why the Greyhound bus was there. And I'll tie all that together by the time we get to the end of the story. It was a race that claimed the life of a racer. Um, there was a, a young Austrian competitor named Helmuth Koenig that was uh, not even 30 years old. Uh, he was decapitated in a crash when his car hit the Armco-style guardrail and passed underneath it. Um, it was a low-speed crash. He had had a very good previous race. He was kind of being looked at as a very strong prospect for the 1975 season, and his life ended at Watkins Glen much in the identical way that another driver named Francois Sivert passed away at the 1973 race. We know that Formula One, through this period, was an incredibly dangerous motorsport. Um, the, the racetracks themselves did not have great safety equipment. The cars themselves were, were, were not really built to withstand any sort of impact and protect the driver. It was all about being light and being fast. So you have those three things happening on the track that are completely overshadowed by what ends up happening off of it. So first, I guess the first thing we have to do is actually establish what the bog is, how the bog came to be, and how the escalation of tensions and or craziness began in the early 70s and ramped up to 1974.
So have you ever been to like a party that is a little bit out of control, a little bit crazy, everybody's having a good time, and then somebody does something dumb and it kind of wrecks it all? That, that in a microcosm is what happened um, to the bog. And when we talk about how kind of things ramped up here, it, it was pretty gradual. You know, it was not like we just went from nothing to burning Greyhound buses. But it's it's you, you give people a little bit of an inch and they take a mile. So, um it's, it's almost like watching a rocket launch, okay? So we've seen the space shuttle, we've seen SpaceX rockets launch, and, and you look at like the first 500 feet and you see this massive object kind of slowly rumbling into the sky, and then all of a sudden it just is, basically it disappears before your eyes because it's going like a 1,000 miles an hour. Well, that first stage of the rocket that will be known as the bog um, really was 1972 so late 1960s as well you know obviously we have the summer of love we have all kinds of uh kind of youth uh youth movement youth protesting youth all kinds of stuff and things get a little crazy at that time in the late 60s and really start to ramp i mean social upheaval woodstock free love the cheap drugs all that kind of stuff um was not uncommon to hear about concerts that kind of went awry, or of course the Altamont concert with the Rolling Stones, very famous there for the riot and the and the murder that happened. Um, but the bog was kind of a product of the times. This was this was something that you know the older generation was freaked out. The decline of Western civilization was upon them. Watching these kids have all this crazy fun, some of it was not that fun. It was just crazy. So by the early 70s, um, things in the bog escalate. Now, this area is called the bog because it's this big grass area that has kind of a, a drainage and or runoff ditch going through it. And without that, you don't have the mud or the muck to create the situation um, that, that this ultimately turns into. Think of Woodstock. Those famous pictures of Woodstock, all muddy, everyone's covered in muck and mire, and then put a bunch of, of gearheads in it and crazy kids in the middle of it that have no interest in music and probably no interest in racing, but interest in partying and doing some drugs and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and you end up with this bog. So back in the day, they started a tradition called running the bog, and that was simply um, you taking your car and trying to muscle it through the mud over the course of the weekend. And, and as you can imagine, the more cars that try to go through this thing, the more sloppy and soupy and gross it gets. So um, if you made it through, that was great. If you got stuck, um, they would come pull you out of your car. They, being the crowd, would come remove you from your car and then set it on fire. And this began somewhere around 72. From everything I've read, everything I've heard, somewhere around 1972 is when the actual burning of the car started. And you can find photos uh, readily available on the Internet of burned out you know, late 60s cars, even some old kind of coupes and stuff that people had brought to the race. So uh, they at least had the... Um, you know, wherewithal to let you get out of the car before they would set it on fire or flip it over and set it on fire or throw Molotov cocktails at it and set it on fire. But ultimately, if you got stuck, um, your stuff was going to be burning to the ground. And, you know, outside of the burning cars, <laughs> which it seems fun enough. Um, people would actually bring magnesium Volkswagen engine blocks. And this is something that's uh, that's gone on for a long time in a bunch of different places. Bonneville Salt Flats is known for this as well. Because um, magnesium is metal, but magnesium burns. Magnesium is flammable. That's why you can't build race cars out of it anymore. Because, you know, when magnesium fires start, they burn white hot. And they're almost impossible to put out. You spray water on it, it gets real bad in a hurry. But Volkswagen engine blocks were made out of magnesium, and people would bring these blocks, and they would they would basically have kind of campfires, a brilliant white flame. Um, you know, drunken maniacs could dance around it, kind of a uh, you know primal primal thing going on with the fire. People would you know turn into you know redneck evil could evil and try to jump their motorcycles over it, or or try to jump themselves over it. Um, not unlike things we see on YouTube today of people doing dumb stuff, except they had all these uh, Volkswagen blocks. You'd go to the junkyard and buy them for nothing, and you'd get them burning, and they would burn for a long time and, and produce this kind of uh, in, in intense white flame. So in 1973, things get a little bit more hairy at the bog. More cars burn, and you know how this works. Guys would go, women and guys would go, have this insane time. They'd come back and tell their friends. Maybe even as crazy as it was, they'd come back and tell their friends, also inflating the stories. So people are like, well, I can't miss this. This is insane. Did they let this happen? This goes on? And the answer is yes, they let it happen. And it did go on. 
And so that's how the escalation happens is people go back and they tell their friends and then they come back and they want to impress their friends by taking things a notch higher. And that's exactly what ended up happening. So in 73, pretty much as bad as 72, um, a little worse maybe just because, again, that escalation of people understanding that they could totally get away with stuff and, you know, more people showing up to, to be a part of it. So the 74 race, as I mentioned, that analogy of a rocket, um, we can, we've seen that rocket now launch off. It's rumbling into the sky. And now in 74, we fire the second stage boosters. And this is not only the peak of the lawlessness, the peak of the debauchery, the peak of the destruction, it also ends up being the end of the bog. Because really, when you hear what happened over this weekend, there was only one thing that the people organizing this racetrack could do, and that is prevent it from ever happening again. So money is why this actually went on for a couple years, and the reality is why does anything like this go on for a couple years? Well, it's because the financial gain is larger than the potential risk factor of putting up with it. The racetrack was making a mint. I mean, thousands upon thousands of people would pay the fee for the weekend and stay in an area that cost the racetrack nothing. They cut the grass and then let it fly over there. And I'm sure that the the mentality at some point was, well, they can't really destroy anything in there. There's nothing to destroy except the things that they brought themselves. So, yes, they had to clean stuff up for a couple days after the race. Yes, they had to clean up garbage. Yes, they probably had to replant the grass. But... In 1974, 73, and 72 specifically, if you have 10, 15, 20, 30,000 people paying you $15 a head to go into a place that costs you nothing and you're a racetrack, how the hell do you turn that money down? And the answer is you don't. You can turn the, bring the cars back for scrap. You put up with it. You have a, a very small incurred cost of mending the land. But other than that, you have made hundreds of thousands of dollars for very little investment. People did get hurt in the bog, but I've never read about anybody being killed in there. And I know that's a kind of a horrible thing to say, what's worse, but multiple people died on the racetrack over the course of 73 and 74 at this event, but nothing I have ever read or found in newspaper clippings or stories or accounts of this talk about anybody dying. I'm sure people got hurt in accidents, being drunk, running into stuff, maybe being burned by messing around with those magnesium engine blocks and the fires they produced. But the fact of the matter is, pretty much everybody that showed up left with a heartbeat, if not a limp, when they left. So people throwing bottles and stuff like that. I mean, one of the one of the accounts I read used the term that uh, there were people knocked down like bowling pins by flying bottles and rocks and whatever people decided to throw into the crowd. Right? It's nuts. The fact that nobody got killed, the fact that nobody was documented as being killed, maybe just good PR by the racetrack or somebody else, but apparently everybody left in one piece. So let's get to the part about Emerson Fittipaldi and why he's kind of to blame for what happened in 1974 at this event. And to do that, we have to talk a little bit about him, his racing background, and where he comes from. So I hope you understand what, I, what I'm saying. I blame Emerson Fittipaldi. I'm joking about that. The guy was uh, an innocent person, an innocent part of this thing. And um, his name only really enters because of, uh, because of the end result of, of the bog. And again, nothing he did directly. But if you've not understood, if you don't know who Emerson Fittipaldi is, and I don't blame you about that, he uh, is an incredible race car driver, Brazilian born, and... His life is very interesting. He's obviously still with us. He has uh, grandsons and sons that are racers. And uh, he was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, his dad actually was a Italian-Brazilian um, racing journalist and a radio commentator. His name is Wilson Filipaldi, Fittipaldi Sr. So I think that's a really neat thing that his dad was uh, a racing journalist and, and racing announcer. And Fittipaldi goes on to become one of the great racers um, really of all time. So, um, 
his career really took off in 1970. Um, he was racing in Formula Two, which is a was a growth series. He had showed great promise there, but like now, breaking into Formula One was very difficult, and it's a very different game now than it was then. But in 1970, Jochen Rent was killed at the 1970 Italian Grand Prix. There we go again, talking about another great name in F1 racing that was killed in this most dangerous era of the sport. But uh, he got Jochen Rent's seat on the Lotus team and became their lead driver. Um, in after like five Grand Prix, the guy was basically the lead man for the Lotus team, one of the most high-profile teams in the world. 25 years old, in 1972, he wins the championship. Now, for the next 33 years, he was the youngest guy to ever win an F1 championship. Now, in 1974, he wins again. That's what we're talking about here at uh, at the U.S. Grand Prix. He finished fourth in the race, but it locked up the championship for him. He was driving for McLaren at that point. He raced in F1 until 1980. Um, really, from 74 up, he didn't do a whole lot. He had only two podium finishes over the course of that four-year period. He raced for his brother and with his brother's team, so I think it was a fun, familiar, familial kind of commitment that he made there. Um, if he had been with other bigger name teams, he probably would have had more success. But racing with his brother was a special, a special deal for him. So after he races in Formula One, he actually brings his career to America and he races in the kart series. Was successful for several seasons. He won the title in 1989. And he won the Indianapolis 500 twice. So not only is this guy a two-time F1 Grand Prix World Champion, he is a two-time Indy 500 winner. And the second time he won it, he was 46 years old. I remember that really. is 1993. I was 13. And I remember watching that race. And, you know, the, the, the guy was so heralded at that point for everything he had done. He then wins again when he's 46 years old. So... He still occasionally will hop in a car. Um, you know, the guy was born in 1946, so he is 73-ish, 74 years old. And he's still a guy you can find at the racetrack uh, pretty frequently, which makes him even cooler in my book. So F1 drivers to this day are national heroes of the countries they come from. And Brazil obviously has produced some of the finest F1 drivers ever, ever and they are some of the most passionate fans of their particular drivers. So... When Emerson Fittipaldi was in position to win this world championship, it was a big deal for Brazilian fans to come watch it happen. So they chartered a plane. They flew into New York City. A bunch of Brazilian fans, they worked with Greyhound, they chartered a bus to drive them to the racetrack. And you have to think that these people were like living the dream. I mean, they're coming to they come to America to, to on this trip. They're going to watch their guy kind of get coronated to become the the F one champion of nineteen seventy four. And um, you know, forty fifty people on this bus has to be absolutely loving life. And you know, the the specific history doesn't tell us what day of the weekend this happened, but I'm going to guess it happened on Saturday. Um, the bus arrives at the racetrack, the Brazilian fans get out, they leave, they go to the pits, the bus driver parks his bus, he leaves and goes to the pits, and he left the bus unlocked and unattended and with the keys in the ignition. So at this point, we have a recipe for complete and utter disaster because we have the bog that has now been filled with drunken lunatics for days, we have an unattended bus, we have people that are out looking for a good time, and guess what? They're going to find it. And they're going to find it in the form of that bus. So some guys end up getting in the bus, firing it up, and driving it into the bog area where they proceed to take it straight into the deepest part of the mud and get it stuck. And basically as quick as those guys could get out of the bus, um, people started lobbing Molotov cocktails through the windows, and within minutes, this entire giant Greyhound coach bus was completely engulfed in flame and belching just the blackest, thickest smoke you've ever seen in your life um, over <laughs> over the entire racetrack. And there are incredible photos of this. I mean, a ring, the rings of people around this bus, there's thousands of people kind of looking on. The smoke could be seen reportedly for miles. Uh, zero people responded to put the fire out. And why would they have? It just, it would, it would have gotten probably worse if they had sent a fire company in there to try to put the thing out. So after the bus burns itself out, uh, the interior is gone, everything's gone. Um, 
the crowd takes the bus and pushes it over onto its side. And then they take the fuel tanks and, and bust into the fuel tanks and, and then set the thing back on fire. So the burned out Hulk is then reignited and a Dodge Challenger, I'm sorry, a, a, yeah, a Challenger got stuck in the mud. Um, and then the Challenger basically was set ablaze and used as kindling to keep the bus deal going. Over the course of this weekend, 12 cars and the bus were burned. And apparently eight of the 12 cars that were burned in the bog that weekend were stolen and driven into the into the pit and then set ablaze by the fans. Now, the Brazilian spectators are out watching the race, watching their driver get coronated as an F1 world champion and celebrating their great national hero. One can only imagine, one can only begin to imagine when the bus driver walked back and said, I thought I left that bus right here and then figures out what's happened. Greyhound did send an additional bus to get the Brazilian passengers back to their uh, hotels in New York City so they could fly home to Brazil. But boy, making that phone call was probably a career-shortening moment for the guy who drove the bus to the racetrack. And, you know, when we look at uh, when we look at these old photos, what's interesting is um, the old photos reveal that there are hundreds, dozens, maybe hundreds of rider trucks on the property. And basically, um, why that was is because over the years, people figured out that it was the best way to camp out there. They would turn those trucks into like an apartment on wheels for the weekend. You know, it was more waterproof than a tent. Um, it was a place you could get some shade, and it was cheaper than renting a hotel. So we can only imagine the shape that those things were returned in. Weirdly, you don't see a lot of the rider trucks in the pictures of, of stuff on fire. So the, the people that brought the trucks in were smart enough not to drive them into the mud bog themselves and then, uh, and then burn them to the ground. To go back to the great story from the Harvard Crimson, I want to have another, another great quote out of, uh, out of this story really kind of caught my attention. Glistening sweat in the violet sunset, they hoist the bus onto its back. This is after they burn the interior out. The horde swarms over its body, urinating from on top. A 1972 Dodge Challenger stuck in the mud is sucked up by the crowd. Before the driver can climb out, the windows are bashed in. Out of the crowd arc Maltov cocktails, their path flickering across 8,000 forms, the fire mirrored on their foreheads. Lurching into the warm at full speed comes another bog car to the tune of I'm the King of Rock and Roll. It runs head-on into the bus. The night sky is consumed by a rising pillar of fire, weaving its eerie, smoke-obscured path across the breadth of the countryside. There is no end to the burning. I drift off to the garages to see the cars being taken apart. At 2 a.m., the bog still lights the western sky. And again, that's Edmund Horsey and the Harvard Crimson from 1974. So you definitely get this apocalyptic feel to what's happened, and... I'm pretty sure everybody leaving had to have known at that point that the party was probably going to be over because what could possibly happen next? What happens in 1975 if something isn't done to stop this? What happens is people probably start getting killed. I mean, you've gotten to a point now where you're a dozen cars, a bus, God knows whatever else. There is complete lawlessness inside this area. And who knows what else is happening in there as well. This is just the stuff we know about. It makes this famed, you know, snake pit at the Indy 500 or the zoo at a Brainerd International Raceway look like Disneyland. This is post-apocalyptic stuff, and in 1974, by the end of the year, the track has decided to act, and they put an end to the bog in the only way that they possibly could. If you're going to stop something like the bog from happening again, there's really only one way you can do it, and um, that's with bulldozers. And that's exactly what the track did. So Formula One continued to race at Watkins Glen all the way up um, into and around 1980. So there were several races after the 1974 fiasco, um, but they sent the bulldozers in, you know, likely first to move the bus and the carnage of the 12 burned cars out of there. And then they bulldozed over the drainage ditch, uh, re-diverted that water with pipes, they added security, and they kind of made it into a parking area. And yes, people still partied there, but it was not absolutely anything near what it ever would have been or was again. And, you know, it's one of those situations where there were 15,000, 20,000 people there 
at the bog. The total attendance of the race, they list that you're at 105,000, which is incredible if we take in the whole weekend. But inside the bog itself, we're probably talking, let's let's use 10,000 as a round number. I've read, I've read everywhere from 8,000 to 20,000, but I think it's going to fall somewhere around 10,000 people. So if we talk about that size group of people, you just can't let it go completely amok, especially with the alcohol and the craziness going on. And um, it just it ran its course very quickly. I think it's an, an incredible story. And I think if if we take it and put it in the modern context, you know, if this is something that happened in 2020, it would cause this insane public outcry. Um, there would be, you know, national news stories about it. We'd once again be revisiting that old, you know, decrying of the decline of Western civilization that the older generation talked about in the late 60s with the, the flower power generation and others. Um, we'd be hearing about people how the racetrack should be closed and how everything should be shut down and how there should never be another race again. There'd be social media posts. There'd be everything. And frankly, in 1974, this barely made the local news. You can't find a lot of newspaper clippings. There was no AP story about the burning stuff in the bog. It was just a thing that happened. And everybody went, well, that probably shouldn't happen again. Roll the bulldozers in and make sure it doesn't happen again. And I think what's uh, what's most fun about this story is the fact that that nobody got killed, you know, and and that's what makes it to me kind of an entertaining story. Yes, there was all kinds of property destruction and all kinds of other stuff, but I think if we look back at it um, in the context of what it was, it was just this insane, out of control party that began in 1970, 71, and in 72 got bigger, and then everybody went home and told their buddies, and in 73 it got bigger, and everyone went home and told their buddies, and then in 74 the pot boiled over, and we saw the ultimate extension of that. People just don't party like they used to, and in some cases that's a good thing, and in some cases maybe that's a sad thing. But in the case of the bog at the 1974 U.S. Grand Prix, it was a one-off that we will never see again. And part of me is thankful for that. And part of me laments the fact that I wasn't there to see it myself and experience it. You can look all this stuff up. There's a load of great photos available on the internet from the early 70s right up until the 74 race. I would encourage you to hit a Google image search and look at just the primal imagery of the Greyhound bus completely engulfed in flames and the thousands of people in their early, mid-20s standing around like it's some sort of a, uh, you know, it's like a Burning Man situation. Very crazy stuff. That's the story of the bog at the 1974 U.S. Grand Prix, the wildest party that has ever been held at a race in the United States. We'll be back next time with another story on the Dorkamotive podcast. Maybe it'll be history. Maybe it'll be burning buses. Maybe we'll be talking about machines. But that's what we do here. Hope you dig it. We'll see you next time.